Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we love you so much. And we are so thankful that you speak to us through your word, by your spirit. And we ask tonight, Lord, as we continue our study through Revelation, that you show us the things we need to learn. Father, we're going to be looking at your return and how exciting that is to see. So we'll be with you when you return to this earth to set up your kingdom. We also pray, Lord, for our worship. Again, we want to honor you. Through the songs we sing unto you, may they come from our heart out of love. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19 as we're continuing our study through the Word of God, and we'll be finishing up this chapter this evening. And as we opened up this chapter last time, we saw all this praise unto God. Why? Because of his righteous judgment upon the earth dwellers, those who are in rebellion against him. And here all of heaven is rejoicing as in, you know, in opposition to what the world was doing. The world was in mourning. They were mourning because commercial Babylon was destroyed. Religious Babylon was destroyed earlier on. All their toys and gadgets were gone. All the material things were gone. And we have the Lord. That can never be taken away from us. We then moved to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we said that this is going to take place, I believe, during the millennial reign of Christ. And not only will the bride or the church be there, but so too will the Old Testament saints, those who were martyred for their faith in Christ during the tribulation period, and obviously those who made it through the tribulation period um, and are believers. And, you know, John the Baptist is also going to be there, as we talked about. In Revelation 19, 19, Verse 9, listen to what we were told. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And as I said last time, the bride's not called to the wedding because she's already part of the wedding. She doesn't need to be called. She already has an invitation, or really she doesn't need an invitation because she's the bride. So this is another group of people and like the ones I uh, shared with you. As we move further on here in Revelation chapter 19, we're going to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Um, and that, of course, is what we've been waiting for since we began the book of Revelation. One person wrote this. He said, a century ago, most people believed that history was progressing inexorably toward a man-made utopia. The Industrial Revolution, the march of scientific discovery, and the increasing pace of social reform seemed to augur nothing but brighter days ahead. Today, however, two world wars, innumerable regional, civil, and national wars, countless acts of terrorism and senseless violence, and the nearly complete collapse of moral values make such rosy optimism seem quaintly naive. The Bible teaches that things will be wonderfully better, but only after they become unimaginably worse. There is only one solution for the world's problems, the return of its true king, the Lord Jesus Christ, to establish absolute monarchy and unilateral authority in his earthly kingdom. Only under his rule will there be peace instead of war, justice instead of inequity, and righteousness instead of wickedness. But that glorious event will not occur without fierce opposition from Satan, his demon hordes, and the world of wicked sinners. The tribulation, the seven-year period immediately before Christ's return, will see the greatest of all human world empires, headed by the evil genius known as Antichrist. The earth will be infested with demons, those who have been here all along, those cast from heaven with Satan, and those released from imprisonment during the tribulation. The tribulation will also be a time of escalating human wickedness, despite the unprecedented outpouring of God's wrath in the sealed trumpet and bowl judgments, stubbornly hardening their hearts against the truth of the gospel. People even then will ostensibly refuse to repent. Even the destruction of Antichrist's magnificent capital city of Babylon will provoke loud laments, but no repentance. But while chaos and turmoil reigns on the earth during the tribulation, the raptured church will be presented in heaven. The church, the bride of the Lamb, will be eagerly awaiting the marriage supper of the Lamb in the millennial earth. But before that wonderful celebration can take place, the warrior king must win the final battle. The forces of heaven and hell will meet in the climatic slaughter of human history, the Battle of Armageddon. At that final holocaust, man's day will end, all of Christ's foes will be vanquished, and his kingdom 
will be established. Yeah, we long for that. Now, the wedding is in heaven, right? When the church is raptured, we have the wedding. And then on earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus coming back, um, and it's, you know, whether people believe it or not, he's coming back. One uh, illustration of that, of, you know, people say, well, you, you know, we've been talking about that for years, but this illustration goes like this. When I left Australia years ago, I said to my mother, Mother, if God spares me, I will come back to see you. For years she waited. Had anyone said to her, Mrs. Talbot, what are you waiting for? She would have said, my boy in America is coming back. And suppose this person said to her, coming back? What do you mean? Surely you don't expect a personal, visible, actual coming. Yes, she would have replied, that's the way he's coming. Possible, her friend might have said, did you ever get letters from him? Do you ever receive gifts? Well, that is what he meant. He's coming in all these things. My mother would have answered, why, the, why? That isn't what he meant, for he said he would come back. Some years afterward, I did cross the ocean, walk down the gangplank from the steamer, and said, Mother, here I am. You know, the Lord has promised us that he's coming back, right? Why do people deny that? It's the craziest thing. And he is going to set up his kingdom. Again, that people deny that. This world is not getting better. I mean, all you have to do is watch the news. And Jesus Christ, when he comes back and sets up his kingdom, he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And then we see a new heaven, a new earth created, and a new Jerusalem. And we will dwell with the Lord forever. It's the eternal state. And ever since Revelation chapter 6, we've been waiting for the physical return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And now we're going to see that take place. And again, people deny it. But what do the scriptures say? You see, that's always my go back to, in a sense. Have you not read what the scriptures say? Revelation 1 7 Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Oh, that's just spiritual. What do you mean? Every eye will see him. It's not spiritual, it's literal. He's coming back. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 27 through 30, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For whenever, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, how do you spiritualize that? That's literally coming back. People are going to see it as light. When lightning flashes across the sky, do you physically see it? Absolutely. You see lightning going across the sky. When Jesus comes back and it says it's just like lightning flashing across the sky, are we going to see him literally? Absolutely. The people of this earth will. So that's what we're looking for, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation 19, starting in verse 11, where we're told, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Only in the book of Revelation do we see a door open in heaven. We saw it in Revelation 4.1. After these things I looked, and behold, a, sta a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. John was caught up into heaven. At the close of the church age, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 speak of the church age. But now, all of a sudden, John hears the voice of a trumpet, and he's immediately caught up. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the rapture of the church. And that's exactly what's taking place. This door in heaven is open for us, the bride, to meet the bridegroom. And here in Revelation 19, we see another door open in heaven. And this is speaking of the return of Jesus Christ with his bride, the church, coming back to the earth. You see, the church has been missing from the earth, starting in Revelation 4.1. But now here, the church is reappearing with the Lord. And we'll see that as we get to Revelation 19, 14. 
Now, this rider on the white horse, there's a lot of speculation about who this rider is. And it really, it's not that complicated. Some confuse this rider on the white horse with, the, uh, with what we read in Revelation 6 too. That's the Antichrist. Here it's Jesus Christ. How can I be so sure? Because the Antichrist is wearing a Stephanos, a crown that's uh, a victor's crown and not a crown of a king. He's holding a bow, the Antichrist, and Jesus is holding what? He's going to be holding a sword, the sword of the Spirit. And think about it. What have been our prayers? Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's being fulfilled. Christians should be the most excited group of people around today because things are happening at unbelievable pace. There was a 7.3 magnitude earthquake off of Australia, between Australia and New Zealand today. 7.3, that's pretty huge. I haven't heard of tsunami warnings on, for New Zealand or Australia yet. But that's a big earthquake, and there's earthquakes happening all over the place. So this prayer is going to be answered. And I'm, again, I don't know why people are, don't look forward to this or deny the Lord's return. Um, it, think about this for a minute. Every, for every one time that the first coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned in the scriptures, the second coming is mentioned eight times. Why? Because God wants us to know these things. He's not trying to hide it. I don't know if you remember, I'm dating myself here, the first Terminator movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger what did he say? What was his famous line? I'll be back. You know, Jesus said that first. He was just copying Jesus. Jesus is coming back, and I'm excited about that. You know, just like Jesus said in Matthew, as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He's coming. There is no doubt about it. And I think why, people, why Christians don't want to believe in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is because they're so happy in this world. They love this world so much that they're not excited about the Lord coming back and righting the wrong that's in this world. And here comes the good guy, right? Riding, riding the white horse. Remember in the old westerns, they don't do this anymore today, but the old westerns, the bad guys wore what color hats? Oh, the black hats. Yeah, they, we, you know, they were the bad guys. They didn't even have to say anything. You go, oh, that's a bad guy. Here comes the guy with the white hat, right? Oh, that's a good guy. Now you can't tell the difference between good guys and bad guys. But here, Jesus Christ is coming back. You know, when Jesus came the first time, what did he ride into Jerusalem on? A donkey, right? And he's, that spoke of coming in peace, which is interesting because he came to bring salvation to every person, that free gift that's found in him. It's a grace gift. We don't deserve it. So he didn't come as a warrior. He came in peace. But when he comes again, he's riding what? A white horse. He's coming as a warrior now. And, you know, I understand that people don't think much about Jesus being a warrior king. Have you not read the scriptures? <laughs> of course he puts down rebellion. Of course he puts down in, in iniquity. He makes war. And what he does is righteous, it's fair. Man's getting what he's due. One writer put it like this. He said, the Lord is a man of war. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. The judging has been going on throughout the the breaking of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, and the pouring out of the bowls. Now he makes war. He who for long centuries has endured patiently the scoffings, the insults, the bad manners of men, who for ages has contemplated Calvary and all that it displayed of human hatred and contempt, and who through the millennia has made peace through the blood of that cross, now makes war over that blood. Wow. We're also told that he's faithful. Jesus is faithful. Aren't you glad? You know, how many people have you encountered in your lifetime that are not faithful? Jesus, we can trust him. 
Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Can you imagine reading the scriptures, trusting them, and then getting into heaven and God goes, just joking. No. What he has promised us, he is faithful to bring it to pass. He's going to do it. He's also true. He's not a counterfeit. How many counterfeits are out there today who think that they're God? He's the real thing. 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Wow, thank you, Lord. He's the genuine article. It's all about him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. We can trust him. He's true. And why is he coming back? John says, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He's going to judge the wicked, those that have rejected him, those who are in rebellion against him, those who have taken the mark of the beast. Not a good thing. says, Wolver had said, all of these passages point to the sad conclusion that in the day of judgment, it's too late for men to expect the mercy of God. There is nothing more inflexible than divine judgment where grace has been spurned. The scene of awful judgment which comes from this background is in flat contradiction of the modern point of view that God is dominated entirely by his attribute of love. There is no doubt that God is a God of love, but he's also a righteous judge. And because he's a righteous judge, he has to deal with sin. He can't ignore sin. But many like to deny it. One writer said, Any view of God which eliminates judgment and his hatred of sin in the interest of an emasculated doctrine of sentimental affection finds no support in the strong and virile realism of the apocalypse. Yeah. I mean, look at all that's going on here. This is just not... a a story. This is a reality. This is what's coming. And we've been through the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bull judgments, how awful they are. We've seen the devastation that the Antichrist brings upon those who love the Lord. Millions upon millions that get saved are martyred for their faith. It's a horrible period of time. Look at what John wrote in, in verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. What do these eyes of fire mean? I think what John is trying to say is that the Lord is all-knowing. He's omniscient, and he's going to judge. You know, Hebrews 4.13, And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Absolutely. How do you hide from God? You can't. You know, we talked about on Sunday about what was going on in Israel with the religious leaders, with the women, how they were worshiping other gods, how they did things in secret, not thinking, thinking that God was unaware. God was totally aware. And he has on his head many crowns, not a Stephanos or uh, the crown a um, of, of victory, a victor's crown, but a diadema, a royal crown, a crown of authority. All authority belongs to him. He's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, guys. Remember Psalm 2, as God the Father is speaking to Jesus, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. That's exactly what's going on here. The nations of the world are going to be given to who? To Jesus. Remember when Jesus was driven into the wilderness after his baptism by the Holy Spirit, driven into the wilderness, Satan tempts him. And one of the things Satan tempted Jesus with was, bow down to me and I will give you all the nations of the world. Isn't that interesting? All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Basically saying, you don't have to go to the cross. You can have it all now. And Jesus, what did Jesus say? 
Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Wow. And here we see again the Father giving Jesus all the nations of the world to rule and reign over from the throne of David. Now, what is his name that no one knows? Nobody knows. <laughs> I'm, I'm, people speculate about that. It's kind of funny. But it says right here, nobody knows. So why do we think, why should we even speculate or guess? The Lord knows, and I'll leave it like that. But remember, there are some things about God we don't fully understand, we don't fully know. But I think one day when we're with him, it'll be very clear. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I, I know in part, but then I shall know, just as I also am known. Back then, you know, mirrors were made out of brass and you couldn't see real clearly, not like the mirrors we have today where you can see really clearly and you put enough light and you can see really, really clearly everything on your face. Back then you couldn't. And that's for us. You know, we see dimly. We, we get a picture of what Jesus is like. But I think when we get to heaven, we're going to go, wow, there's so much more, right? When we see him face to face. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You know, too many times people focus on things that the Bible's not speaking about or trying to find things that we can't understand. And God says, you know what? I've already told you many things that you need to do that you should understand. Do those things, right? Don't get confused with all these other things. Instead of trying to figure out what God says, if we can't know it, we can't know it. Let's focus on what God has told us and live accordingly. And there are some things that, you know, we can write on a piece of paper and put in a drawer and say, Lord, I don't get it now. I'm just putting this question here. I don't understand it. And God can reveal it over time. There's no doubt about that. But this thing here, we're not going to know. Not here. Verse 13 of Revelation 19. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So, We've seen in our studies in Revelation, the armies of the world are going to gather together to fight against the Lord from Megiddo to Basra. It's about 200 miles or 184 miles to be more exact. Um, and we read of this in Isaiah 63 verses 1 through 6. Now here's the amazing thing to me. Back in the Old Testament, we're getting a description of Jesus Christ coming back to pour judgment upon a world that's in rebellion against him. And we see how his robe is stained with the blood of the wicked. Listen to what we're told. Who is this who comes from Edom, who dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury has sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. And it's interesting because as Jesus is moving from the north to the south, from Megiddo down to Basra, in this battle, who's in Basra? The Jews. Remember, they fled to the rock city of Petra. And I think it's here where Jesus meets them and they see their Lord. The Mount, I think everyone there at Petra is saved. And we get an even more graphic description of this in Revelation 14, 20. 
where it says, And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs, almost 200 miles. This is what's going to take place in the Battle of Armageddon. The blood of the wicked are going to be splattered upon the Lord's garments. Now again, people go, do you know for certain that this is the Lord? Absolutely. How could I be so certain? Because listen to what it says. Who's the one that's coming? He's called what? The Word of God. Well, that should just ring a bell, right? The light should go on. He's called what? He's called the Word of God? Well, that's interesting because what did John say in John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There it is. The Word what became flesh, dwelt among us, Jesus. God became flesh. And he tabernacled among us. And I, think, I always find that interesting, the word tabernacle uh, is speaking of the tent in the wilderness, the tabernacle in the wilderness with the Holy of Holies. Well, God tabernacled among them. What does that mean? It means the glory of God was veiled in this tent, this body of flesh. So this is obviously Jesus and we're going to read of the armies who come with Jesus to this battle. I don't think we're coming to fight, as we're going to see. These armies are not coming to fight with the Lord. Think about it. Does the Lord really need our help? No. He's Almighty God, so no, he doesn't. Look at verse 14 here in Revelation 19. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The Lord is coming back and he's be, going to be accompanied by the armies in heaven. Who are these armies? Well, obviously I think it's the bride, the, the church. Paul wrote in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I think that's speaking of the rapture. But here's the thing. So we go to be with the Lord at the rapture, the bride, or the bride and the bridegroom. We have the marriage taking place. We're going to always be with the Lord, right? So if the Lord returns to earth, do you think we're going to return with him? Absolutely. So that should just make sense as we think this through. Um, what about the tribulation saints who were martyred for their faith in Christ? I think they're coming with the Lord too. The Old Testament saints, could they be coming? Possibly. So there a large group of people um, are coming. In fact, in Matthew 25, verse 31, Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Isn't that interesting? Even the angels are coming with him. Can you imagine this multitude of people and angels Coming with the Lord. What kind of weapons are we bringing? Oh, we're not carrying any. Because we don't need any. We're not fighting. Jesus is going to do battle. And what does he do battle? What does he use? The sword of the Spirit. And we'll see that as we read on. Jude ver chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. Verses 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Do you see that? Ten thousands of his saints. That's the biggest number in the Greek, ten thousands. Ten thousands, you can't get any more. It's innumerable believers, millions upon millions, are coming with the Lord. And he's going to do battle. Revelation 17, 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. We're just hanging around. We're just with him. 
because the Lord doesn't need our help. He's God. Look at verse 15 here in Revelation 19. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the Lord is fighting against the armies of the world. And again, if man would just think about this, how do you fight against your maker? How do you fight against God? You can try, but do you really think you're going to win? Well, obviously Satan did. He thought he could win when he fought against God. He was the anointed cherub. I believe he was the worship leader in heaven. But he wanted to be the most high. He wanted to be worshipped, and he still does. And we see that portrayed here in Revelation, that the Antichrist is worshipped, the Satan is worshipped. Psalm 2, as you read that, it's almost humorous because as the nations gather to fight against God, what does God do? He laughs. He laughs. Because creation cannot fight against their creator. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, they need to make peace with God through Jesus Christ before it's too late. And, you know, I, I realize that, and this is just the way we title it, we call it the Battle of Armageddon. This is not a battle, guys. You know, it's not like, oh, is the Lord going to win this? This is close. It's going back. And This is not a battle. The Lord is going to wipe them out. He judges them by the sword, with the sword, a long, broad sword, ramphema in the Greek. And it comes out of his mouth. That's kind of weird, huh? People have tried to paint pictures of, of this. Are you kidding me? Really, you really think a literal sword is coming out of his mouth? Not at all. Well, then what is it speaking of? What do the scriptures tell us? Ephesians six seventeen, The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So as he speaks forth, it's like a sword cutting the people down. They're going to be judged by the word of God. Isaiah 11, 4. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. There it is again. We got it in the Old Testament, Isaiah 11, 4. We're told here in Revelation 19. He conquers by the power of his word. Think about it. He created the universe all, everything, right? With just his word. And it says it, he did it in six days. Did he need six days? No. Well, why did he do, use six days? I think he was setting a pattern for us. You work six days, and what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. And that's what man's to do. So he didn't need six days. And here in this judgment, how long is it going to take? I think it's going to be very quick. I don't think this is going to be a long, drawn-out battle. Because he's God. They're going to be wiped out. Remember when uh, Jesus was being arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they asked him, are you the one? And he said, what did he say? I am. And what happened? Oh, they fell, all fell over backwards. Wow, the power of God. All the Roman soldiers fell backwards, not slain in the spirit, but they were knocked over by the power of God. So this is not going to be a big deal here. This is going to be pretty simple. Um, and think about it. Those who have taken the mark of the beast, worship the Antichrist and Satan, rejecting Jesus, they're going to be destroyed. And the Lord, those who, everyone who makes it through the tribulation period are going to be judged. The sheep will enter into the kingdom age. The goats will be separated uh, for a time until the great white throne judgment. Now, it says that he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. The word rule can also speak of shepherd. And I think that's what the Lord is saying here, that he's going to 
use the shepherd's rod of correction upon all those who get out of line in the kingdom age. Re rebellion is not going to be tolerated. Now, when we think of rebellion, we think about all that's going on today. Are you kidding? It's going to be very s small in numbers, and it will be dealt with right away. Righteousness is going to fill this land, and thus he's going to his rule is going to be fair. It's going to be right. And then he's going to, we see the treading of the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's total judgment. Total judgment. And embroidered on his robe, tattooed on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow. Can you imagine seeing him with his robe? Wow. How magnificent that's going to be. And he's going to have sovereign rule and victory over all his foes and into the kingdom age. And here's the battle of Armageddon as we read on here. Verse 17 of Revelation 19. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So here we see all the, the armies of the Antichrist joined together in the Valley of Megiddo to fight against the Lord and his anointed. And again, it doesn't matter what kind of weapons they have. They're futile. They're not going to be able to do anything. And those who came to fight against the Lord are going to be supper for the scavenger birds. That's what kind of slaughter this is going to be. One writer said, this tells already an awful story. It tells of the greatest of men made food for the vultures, of kings and leaders, strong and confident, devoured on the field with no one to bury them, of those who thought to conquer heaven's anointed king, rendered helpless even against the timid birds, a vaunting gods of nature turned into, turned into its cast off and most dishonored dregs. And what is thus for intimidated is thus for intimate soon becomes reality. The great conqueror bows the heavens and comes down. He rides upon the cherub horse and flies upon the wings of wind. Wow. He's, ex he's pouring out his wrath upon these armies, and again, I don't think we can imagine the slaughter. You know, we've seen pictures of the D-Day of invasion, and it's horrible, isn't it? You know, these men getting off these boats and being shot as they're coming off. Horrible. But can you imagine when it's millions and millions and millions of people slaughtered, and now the vultures, the birds are coming to eat their flesh? Not a pretty picture. God's not intending it to be a pretty picture. He wants to show the reality of what's going to happen when people of this world who are fighting against them, what's going to happen to them? Remember what I said last time, that you can either come to the marriage supper of the lamb or you could be supper for the birds of the air. Those are the two alternatives. And instead of seeing what's on the menu, you end up being the menu, right? Not a good picture. Look at verse 19 here in Revelation 19. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Again, I don't think this battle lasts very long. I think it's probably a day. It's very short. Um, and, you know, like I said, God created the heavens and the earth very quickly. He can do this battle very quickly also. And isn't it interesting how man amasses great military armies, military weapons, and they're totally useless? Totally useless. That's the best that man can do against Almighty God. It, it's crazy when you think about it. I told you before when 
when I was in junior high and, you know, I was a little guy. You think I'm little now, you should have seen me in junior high. I didn't hit 100 pounds till I was a sophomore in high school. And I don't think I hit five feet until I was a, a sophomore in high school. And one of my friends and I got into a fight. And this guy was a Nephilim. Well, he really wasn't a Nephilim, but he was really big. He was probably five, eight, six feet. You know, he was a giant to me. He was a Nephilim. And uh, so we started fighting. And I'm a big, tough guy. I thought I was. And what he did was he put his hand on my forehead and pushed his arm out, and I couldn't reach him. And so I'm swinging like this, and I'm, I'm like, well, this is ridiculous. And that was the end of the fight. Well, that's really, a, it, it, to give you a picture, that's how it is with God. How are you going to fight against Almighty God? Okay, Joe, have your fun, but you're not going to go anywhere. You can try and fight against what I want you to do, but you're better off surrendering to me. And that's what we see here. Don't fight against God. You'll never win. And if you could win, you would lose. Ray Stedman said this, It is almost incredible, is it not, that when Jesus reveals himself and every eye sees him, that these leaders of the nations actually attempt to assault and attack the Lord himself. They gather together to make war against the Lord and his armies. But it is an unequal contest. The beast and the prophet are immediately captured and thrown into the lake of fire, which in chapters 21 and 22 is called the second death. It is a terrible symbol of eternal torment, a fire, an inward torment that burns on and on and never ends. And the rest, we are told, are killed by the word of God, not by a physical weapon, but by the simple word spoken. You know, the Antichrist thought he was real powerful, right? But how long was his reign? Seven years. That's it. That's nothing. And now, the Antichrist and the false prophet, who thought they were so big and powerful, deceiving the earth dwellers, are placed in the lake of fire with brimstone. That's the final torment after Hades for all those that have rejected Jesus Christ, also called outer darkness. Why the lake of fire? Why it would burning with brimstone? Why then outer darkness? Because when you are totally away, apart from God, there is no light because God is light. And there's only darkness apart from God. So they have eternal darkness burning with fire. Again, not a pretty picture. And the Antichrist, the false prophet, are the first to experience Gehenna, a symbol that... Uh, Jesus used Gehenna was uh, a described by Jesus as a place of everlasting punishment. Mark 9.43, it is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to Gehenna into the fire that shall never be quenched. Luke 12.5, fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into Gehenna. Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, is an actual valley in the city of Jerusalem. That's where it, initially it was a place where they offered children as a sacrifice to the god Moloch and then became a garbage dump. And this garbage dump would kind of smolder and all the time. And Jesus used that as an illustration. That that's what Gehenna is like. It was interesting, several years ago when we were in Israel, it had snowed. And uh, we told our tour guide that we wanted to go see Gehenna again. He goes, well, you've already been there. Why do you want to go see it again? And we said, well, with all the snow, we wanted to see when hell froze over. And he just thought we were crazy Americans, which we were. Now, the false prophet, the Antichrist, are in this lake of fire, Gehenna this outer darkness. After the millennial reign, after the thousand-year reign of Christ, there is the great white throne judgment, which we'll get into um, as we continue on here in Revelation. And all those that have rejected Jesus will be cast or moved from Hades to outer darkness, Gehenna, along with Satan. Again, we'll see that in Revelation chapter 20. 
And I realized that this is a very touchy subject for some because they, can't, they don't like talking about hellfire and damnation. Um, I think we moved so far away from that. You know, years ago, that's all it was talked about. Today, it's not talked about at all. And yet Jesus spent more time talking about hell than any other Bible writer. You could put them all together. He spoke more of them, of this place. Why? Because God wants us to understand what it's like. He wants us to make the right choice knowing the consequences of the choices we make. Now, here's the thing. When an unbeliever dies today, what happens to him? If he doesn't go to Gehenna, if he doesn't go to outer darkness, where does he go? He goes to a place called Hades. It means the unseen world or the realm of the dead. Well, what happens to believers today when they die? They go to be with the Lord. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We along that. We long for that time. Paul said, you know, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. These bodies are going back to the dust of the earth. These bodies, physical bodies, are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They can't. Why? Because of the sin nature. These bodies cannot. They have to be changed. That's what Paul talked about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And we'll get our spirits and soul go to be with the Lord. And at the rapture, the body that God is preparing for us will be united with our spirit and soul. Paul in Philippians chapter 1 said, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Years ago, when we were, Julie and I were on a cruise, I sat with a Christian couple. And, you know, I like talking about the Lord. And we started talking about, you know, when we die, what happens to us. He, he had some physical illness. He was in a wheelchair. He was pretty sick. Um, and so we started talking about that. And I said, well, you know, Paul said, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah, that was probably not the thing to say. He was pretty mad. He said, no, we go to sleep. There is no being with the Lord. I said, and I started talking, arguing with him. I said, well, what did Paul mean to be absent from the body? Well, that was kind of the end of our conversation. You know, we were pretty, we had a nice conversation until that point. Why was he so mad? Because he couldn't counter what I had said. And I wasn't trying to be mean. I was just saying, hey, we're not going to sleep, man. We're going to be with Jesus. I don't need to sleep in heaven. I want to be awake with him, don't you? So, yeah, there is no sleep or annihilation or any of that. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And that salvation, that gift is for everyone. But you could reject it or accept it. It's a choice that everyone has to make. And for the wicked, they are going to be judged. Look at how this chapter concludes. Verse 21. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Wow. Millions upon millions are going to die here. But not be, it wasn't because they weren't sufficiently warned. They were warned, weren't they? Absolutely. Back in Revelation chapter 14, we see an angel flying in the midst of heaven, warning people to worship God, the true God, to give him glory. He's given the gospel message. Can you imagine? Here's this angel one last time throughout the world in every language, bringing the gospel message for people to make a choice. Talk about God's grace and mercy, right? So man has no excuse. God has created us for life, not for death. But sin separates us from God. That's the problem. We are created to bring him pleasure. There is another problem. What do I mean by that? When we're so interested in doing our own thing and not following the Lord, we're not doing things that would please him, honor him. And I'm not saying you can't have a good time, can't enjoy yourself. Of course you can. But are you serving the Lord? What are you doing for the Lord? You know, remember Elijah? You know, he, 
he fought against the prophets of Baal, right? They met on Mount Carmel. And they set up a sacrifice. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, you talk to your God and see if he'll accept your sacrifice. And it was all day going on. You know, they're screaming and yelling, you know. You know, Elijah said, you know, I don't, maybe you need to scream a little louder. You know, maybe he can't hear you. Or, you know, he might be on vacation. He could be going to the bathroom. Who knows? I don't know what your God's doing, but, you know, he's not answering you. Well, that just, you know how that irritates? Well, they're cutting themselves and jumping up and down. And, you know, pretty much Elijah said, that is it. He called for the sacrifice the wood to be placed, the sacrifice to be placed, get, I think it was three uh, uh, pots of water to be poured on the sacrifice. Water was all over it, and he cried out to God, and pff, fire came down from heaven, took the sacrifice, and they killed the prophets of Baal. Well, then Ahab's wife, Jezebel, finds out. She basically says, look, if I don't have the head of Elijah, kill me. So there's a price on Elijah's head. Jezebel wants him dead, and what does he do? He runs for his life. He's running from this woman. She must have been pretty nasty. And where does he end up? Elijah ends up in a cave. And it's such an interesting story because the Lord says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? And what does Elijah say? Oh, Lord, you know it's only me. I'm the one who loves you. Nobody loves you like I do. Come on, Lord. There is nobody in this world that loves you like I do. And God said, you know, Elijah, what are you doing in this cave? And you know what the answer is? Nothing. I'm really sorry there's no cave ministries. If you're isolating yourself from the world, something's wrong. But you know I love you. Well, then go out and do something. Don't isolate yourself. There's a world of people out there, right, that need Jesus. We should have that kind of passion knowing the days we're living in. Russia, for the first time, fired at an Israeli plane from Syria. It's getting intense. Russia pulled some Russian troops out of Syria, but Iranian troops went in. It's amazing. Have you looked at what's going on with the government in Israel? The prime minister has lost power. He's lost his advantage. There's probably going to be elections again in September. There's so much going on that we should be so excited and desire to witness to people. Time is short. How long? A year, five years, 10 years, 15, 20? I don't know. It doesn't look like it could be that long. But, you know, God is long-suffering. But let's use the time we have for, to our advantage here. I've told you before, I always wanted to be around when the church got started in the first century to be part of that. And as I look at life now, I go, man, you know what? I'm part of the church at the close of church history. The start of the tribulation period is getting closer. But what about all this persecution? What about all this trouble? What about this? What about that? Did God die? Is God not on the throne? Of course, God did not die. He is still on the throne. We don't have to worry. Does it mean it's going to be easy for us? No. I mean, look at the millions of Christians that were martyred for their faith when the church got started. We don't understand that. You know, we think everything was great. Hey, let's be a Christian. Everyone's a Christian now. They got the Jesus robes on, you know, whatever. I don't know. No, the Jews who became Christians lost everything because they were kicked out of the synagogue, which means they lost their job. They lost their families because their family considered them dead. They had nothing. That's why Paul 
took up an offering to help the Jews in Jerusalem from the Gentile churches that he went to. You see, we think, hey, if we're serving the Lord, everything's going to be perfect. It's not. You will face opposition. It's probably be one of the hardest things you can ever do. If you don't face any opposition, you have to wonder, am I doing anything? Because Satan really doesn't care then. But you will face opposition. You will face discouragement. You will face all kinds of issues. But if you know you're serving the Lord, keep moving. You know, look at what's taking place here. The battle's all over. We're coming into the kingdom age where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign. I don't know about you, but I can't, I, I don't want to take time and miss what the Lord wants to do through me. I don't want to miss that. I want to be open to the doors of opportunity he brings across my path, right? I think all of us feel that way. It's like, okay, let's pray. Lord, how do we reach this community? You know, keep Vacation Bible School in prayer. This is a powerful study for the kids, the sanctity of life. When kids have, don't have any hope anymore, life is, you don't even know who you are anymore. We're going to tell them. I don't care who you are. God loves you and created you. And he's got a plan for your life. I think adults need to hear that too, right? Because again, we've taken all this hope away. Why is the world trying to remove our hope? So that they can come in with their hope, the government of hope. It's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? <laughs> the government of hope? I don't know. It, it just seems too crazy for me. My hope is in Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, give me the strength to endure till the end. That in all I do, I can honor you, no matter how tough it gets. This, is, this battle here of Armageddon is nothing for the Lord. And, you know, the paradise lost back in Genesis when Adam sinned, guess what? Paradise regained here in Revelation as we will be with the Lord for the kingdom age and then on, then on into the eternal state when God creates a new heavens and a new earth. People, even Christians, may mock you for believing in the rapture, in the return of the Lord to set up his kingdom, so what? I know there's a lot of people, a growing movement, that there is no rapture. We're going through the tribulation period. And they've never been able to answer me. Well, I guess they can answer it this way, some of them. But I, I ask them, why would God beat up his bride before he marries her? He's taken us home. We are not made for wrath. Before God could destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened with Lot? You have to get out, the angel said, before that's destroyed. God is going to call his ambassadors home before he judges this world. I'm very confident in that. There is no doubt in my heart that the rapture happens before the tribulation period begins. Why? Because the church age comes to an end. And what does the seven-year tribulation period rep represent? The 70th week of Daniel, which is all Jewish territory. We're not part of that. And I don't know. I'll just, Titus 2, verses 13 through 15. Paul's talking to Titus, a young pastor in Crete. And listen to what he says. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. Hey, don't be swayed by the multitudes of people that have all kinds of answers that contradict what the Word of God has to say. Look for his return. That's our hope. And it's our only hope for this world. As I said, for every one verse, 
of the first coming of Jesus Christ, there's eight speaking of a second coming. It's going to happen. Of the 1,845 references in the Old Testament, a total of 17 Old Testament books give it prominence. Of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, there are 318 references to the second coming, or one out of 30 verses. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. The only books that are missing, four of them, three are single chapter letters written to individual persons on a particular subject, and the fourth is Galatians, which implies really Christ is coming again. So, wow, you know, the Lord is coming back. Yeah, it's getting very dark out there, but it's always darkest before the dawn, isn't it? And what's going to happen? The Lord is going to call us home and boom, instantaneously, the bride will be caught up to the bridegroom. And then, as we've read tonight, he comes back to set up his kingdom on this earth. And that's the choice for people. Would you rather have dinner with the Lord at the marriage supper of the Lamb or be dinner for the birds of the earth? I know that sounds horrible, but it's just the reality, right? Two meals are being prepared. Which one do you want to be partakers of? To me, I want to be with the marriage supper of the Lamb, don't you? That day is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. It's a very difficult subject, Lord, as we see the carnage upon this world, upon people, Lord, but it's a result of them rejecting you. And you are a righteous judge, and you judge with all fairness and righteousness. Uh, Lord, I pray for people today that don't know you. Soften their hearts, open their eyes, help them to see you, Lord. Give us opportunities to minister the love of Jesus Christ. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.